Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. It is the day before the Super Bowl. Let's talk boxing. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, there was a masterful, really spectacular jab performance the other day that you need to take a note of, right? When a technician is facing someone who doesn't move that well, right? Doesn't really have great timing, can't really punch their way in, doesn't have the foot speed to leap their way in, right? Has been around the game a while so that they've reached the point where they can't really hide their upper body. They're older, they've fallen into bad habits. Then the way to really destroy that person, especially if that person is a counter puncher and is waiting for the gap between after you've thrown a punch and when you could throw your next punch to start their offense. The way to destroy that person is with a great double jab, right? What the jab does, especially if the person doesn't have great foot speed, can't really leap in, isn't explosive, is the jab keeps them outside. What the double jab does is it destroys their timing, right? They're timing a counter off your jab you throw a double jab, it keeps them outside. If the person can't really bend at the waist, you're going to bludgeon them. Their head is going to take a lot of punishment. Now, that's exactly what happened in really a jab masterpiece. It's one of the best uses of a jab I have seen over the course of a fight in recent memory. And that was done by Clarissa Shields in her win over... Ivana Habison, right? Now, I don't mean to diss Habison that much, but let's just say movement is a big part of the game. And when someone isn't explosive, when someone can't move suddenly, when someone can't bend that well to hide their upper body to make the jab miss, when someone can't make the adjustments, in other words, they're getting hit with the jab in the second round, they're getting hit with the jab in the seventh round, right? When someone can't stay low and fight low, then they were sitting duck for what Clarissa Shields did. Let me also point out, too, that by chance, Paulie Malignaggi, a great jabber himself in his day, was doing the uh, color commentary on the telecast. And he made the point that Shields was so masterful with the jab, one wondered whether she even needed her other hand in the fight. Right? I'm really a child of the Larry Holmes era. As I like to say with regard to Larry Holmes, the fight didn't start until an opponent figured out what to do with Larry's jab. Ivana Habasan never figures out what to do with Clarissa Shields' jab. Just to understand that as Shields, who's a risk taker, right? This fight was at a lighter weight than Shields usually fights. As Shields continues to take risks, looking for worthy opposition. Just to understand that she has a great jab in her toolkit, right? Once you see the jab, once you realize that Habison can't make the adjustments, the fight is over. It's just a matter of playing out the string, right? Let's talk about some other fights. Now, I tip my hat to Jean Pascal. I really do, right? In his mid-30s, he is a champion at light heavyweight for a major sanctioning body, right? He beat Marcus Brown. His last fight was against Badu Jack. But understand, boxing is a young man's game. It really is. Right? I understand you've had some older 
light heavyweight champs who've done great things. Archie Moore, for example, right? I understand some of the other guys at light heavy are older right now, right? Alvarez is older. Um, the guy Canelo just beat Kovalev is older. Uh, Kovalev's amateur rival Baturbiov has a share of the belt. I'm just telling you to expect big change. Big change at light heavyweight. The problem with aging was apparent on both sides of the ring. In the Pascal Badu Jack fight. Right? The guys went about it a little bit differently. Pascal is the older guy who is great for the first five rounds of a 12-rounder. He's still Jean Pascal those first five rounds. Right? The quickness is there. He can move. He's throwing hard punches. He drops Badu Jack in the fourth round of this fight. Right? Off of a heavy punch. He's the kind of guy, if he's fighting Clarissa Shields, for example, he's the kind of guy in the first five rounds who could dodge her jab and then leap inside and be up on her. Right? He has that foot speed early. He has the punch resistance early. He has the volume early. The problem is there's an expiration date on his A game in fights. If his opponent has a pulse and is actually trying to engage him, is actually forcing him to be his best, which is what Badu Jack did, right? You understand that in the second half of a fight, I would argue it's even more than the second half of the fight, right? The second, let's just say the last 55 to 60 percent of a Jean Pascal fight, he's going to be running on empty. Right? He's the guy at the park who looks great the first few buckets. Then, of course, you notice as the game progresses, the guy he's sticking is just running by him and getting layups. Well, Badu Jack shows you the other problem older guys have. Right? Badu Jack knows how to fight. Badu Jack has been a champion. Badu Jack has been in the ring with some excellent fighters over the years. Right? He's, he's a guy who has certainly fought world-class fights. Right? But at this stage, Badu Jack understands that if he steps on the accelerator two or three times early in a fight, He's going to run out of gas. So what he does is he doesn't get the car in fourth gear. He keeps the car in third gear. Right? So you're watching a Badu Jack fight and he's conserving his energy. This is like George Foreman when he came back and he'd be fighting a young lion. You could tell Foreman was conserving his energy. Right? If he, if he reached... The decision that he couldn't knock out the other guy quickly. Or if he wasn't fighting a senior citizen like himself. Foreman would linger a bit. So you notice Foreman against Michael Moore. That knockout's a later knockout. Right? Foreman against Tommy Morrison. Foreman lets that fight develop. He doesn't jump on Morrison. Well, Badu Jack has to cut it razor close, right? Because he's doing next to nothing early in fights. Has anyone figured this out? You know, he's a slow starter by design. It's as if he knows he only has three or four great moments in him these days. So he's waiting for the sun to come out. He's waiting for his opponent to tire a little bit before he reveals himself. And when he does, he's so accustomed to driving in third gear that he can't be explosive. Let me point out, too, sometimes he runs into problems like this Jean Pascal fight. 
where while he's waiting for Jean Pascal to get tired, he gets caught with a hook, he gets dropped. <laughs> so he's lost the early rounds, and he's been knocked down. So that's another point for Jean Pascal, <laughs> right? You know, that 10-9 that round, suddenly a 10-8 round. And so then Badu Jack, you know, in the second half of the fight, really needs a knockout, right? He, he mounts a comeback, but understand, it's hard to discourage your opponent when your opponent has swept the first half of the fight and has knocked you down, right? The opponent at that point knows, okay, look, you know, if my internal scorecard is right, all I have to do is survive the last half of this fight without hitting the canvas, and I'm live for a decision, right? So let me just say, you hear Jean Pascal and Badu Jack fighting each other. Hey, if this were 2014, wow, that'd be a whale of a fight. It's now 2020. Let me also say, sooner or later, Jean Pascal is going to run into a young guy with more stamina, with more lung capacity, with more volume, a guy who can start fast with him and then wilt him in round six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Just make a note that John Pascal, currently the WBA light heavyweight champion, is at risk if he fights a young lion who knows what he's doing. By the way, when I say who knows what he's doing, that rules out Marcus Brown right there. Right? Because Marcus Brown, I know he's talented. I know he has a great jab. I know he moves well. Right? But you can tell the fighters who seem to get caught up in the crowd, who seem to get caught up in the emotions, and who haven't reached a stage yet in their careers where they're mathematical in the ring. Right? I'm expecting Jean Pascal, unless he fights some older fighter, some other guy in his 30s, I'm expecting Jean Pascal to lose to Bivol when the two guys fight. Let me just say too, Baturbiov is interesting. He's an older fighter too. Baturbiov though seems to have much more stamina to me, much more stamina than Jean Pascal does. Right? If those two guys fight, it's going to be must-watch TV for at least the first four to five rounds. After that, I would expect Baturbiev to take over. One man's opinion. We'll see how the light heavyweight division develops. Let's talk about another masterpiece in terms of a fight style. Right? I mentioned Clarissa Shields using a jab masterfully, right? That's a jab fest. She's masterful in her fight against Ivana Habazan. Well, let me just say, for years now, people here online, okay, here's Alexa crashing my video. Figure that one out. Well, let me just say this. Um, there's a fight style. I call it mid-range hooking. A guy who wants to set up a pocket, a guy who's two-handed, a guy who throws predominantly hooks, a guy who alternates, right, between right hand and left hand, right, an elite mid-range hooker will set it up where he has his head down and you don't know if he's throwing the punches up top or down low. Right? Let me also point out, too, that because the guy is two-handed and because the guy wants to fight at mid-range, in other words, he wants a pocket set up, he has to have a defensive construct and timing where he's able to be around the pocket. And while he's mid-range hooking, he has a hand up somehow. Right? He also has to be able to be in a space where you don't get the opportunity to break his flow. Now, if you're into mid-range hooking, let's just say Danny Garcia's victory over Ivan Redkoch 
was masterful. Right? It's masterful. Red Catch makes the mistake of allowing a pocket to be set up. Once the pocket is set up, you'll notice Danny Garcia is throwing hooks and he's attentive to Red Koch's body. Right? So he's throwing a right hand repeatedly. He's loading up on a right hand to Red Koch's body. And Red Koch is too caught up in the moment, right? He reminds me of Marcus Brown. He's trading too much with Danny Garcia. It's an excellent fight by Garcia. I thought Garcia, after a little bit of a rocky start, takes over. And I'm sure Ivan Red Koch has no idea how to deal with Danny's fight style. Let me also say, too, tomorrow in the Super Bowl, you're going to have a quarterback, Pat Mahomes, who throws no-look passes. Right? Travis Kelsey's over here. Mahomes is looking this way, but he's aware of the route. He sees the DB in his peripheral vision. And Mahomes, who used to be a guard in basketball. Mahomes will then just throw the ball without looking at the guy. Well, understand, Danny Garcia does no-look punches. You cannot track his eyes if you're an opponent. Right? Danny will look away. He'll literally look off at the distance. Meanwhile, he's throwing a mid-range hook, right? Because he knows where your feet are. He knows where you are. And if you lean forward, like Iva does in this fight, he knows where your chin is. He knows you're at mid-range. Right? And so Danny Garcia is very tricky because as he throws it, when the punch is here, you don't know if he's turning it up top or down low. You can't track his eyes because his eyes, he'll look off this way. He'll look over here. Right? While he's throwing a punch that you don't know is going high or low. Well, let's talk about how to deal with Danny Garcia. There was another title fight where a guy put on a great performance. You've had some great performances in the last four weeks, folks. This was for the super featherweight title. The fighter whose fight style would give a mid-range hooker a hard time is the guy who took the title, Jojo Diaz. Right? What I like with Diaz is when you're fighting a mid-range hooker, and he's not. He was fighting Tevin Farmer, but you see the style would just fit Danny Garcia like a glove. Garcia, welterweight, different weight class. We're just talking about styles. But understand, the first rule of fighting a mid-range hooker is to not have the fight at mid-range. Right? You want to either be short range up on him, Errol Spence, right? Short range up on him, guy can't extend his arms, guy can't get leverage on his shots, or you want to be back too far away, but explosive. So, of course, while you're back, you can just throw that straight right hand, right? You can just come in the pocket with straight right hands. You can drop a shoulder, throw uppercuts. In other words, mid-range hookers like this, you need to split the uprights, right? And, of course, you don't want a pocket set up. So you're far away, you're up close, you're using lateral movement. You hit the guy, even when you land, you move a little bit away. You move off at the side, right? You don't allow a mid-range hooker to get rhythm, to go right, left, right, left. You don't want that. So you want to make sure, even if the mid-range hooker lands a shot, you move. The hooker has to reset. Well, let me just say this. I know there was a lot said before this Jojo Diaz, Tevin Farmer fight. And Farmer's mentally tough. But I'll say this. He did not have Jojo Diaz's speed. Either hand speed or foot speed just didn't have it.
his reflexes look dim to me by comparison with Diaz, right? Also defensively, Diaz would get cooking. Diaz is explosive, so Diaz would come in with a right hand, right? And Farmer just doesn't have his hands up, right? Farmer is accustomed to being offensive. You can tell his defense needs work, right? It needs work. And so Diaz is a bright light. Understand a lot is happening around that weight class as you can imagine, right? Just, under, just put a circle around Diaz's name because he's a guy who, to me, given his punching power, given his explosiveness, given the fact that he seems to be aware that there are times where he doesn't want a pocket set up, and that's interesting, with a guy who has this level of punching power. Understand, too, Diaz, and I know he doesn't have a high KO percentage, okay, fair enough, but the guy is clearly a puncher who, when he hits you, you're dazed. You're unprepared to handle the rest of his combination, and he throws combinations. This is a guy who only has one loss. And now here he is in Leo Santa Cruz country, we'll uh, call it, right? You know, right around the uh, weight class. He's at a weight class where I'm sure accommodations could be made where he could fight Gervonta Davis, right? This guy is dangerous. I think he is more sudden than Leo Santa Cruz. I know he moves much better, in my opinion, than Gervonta Davis. I'll say this. I keep expecting Davis to have a tougher time in fights than he's had. But let's be clear here. He fights Yorkies Gamboa, and Gamboa has an Achilles problem early in the fight, and Gamboa was able to Gabo was able to last the rest of the fight, right? And so, you know, to me, uh, when I see a guy who can move, who's conscientious of spacing, like Jojo Diaz is, right? A guy who can lead with power shots, who's sudden. And then I look at Gervonta Davis, a guy who, let's face it, has had problems at more than one way in making weight. Right? A guy who's a gifted puncher, but who might not be ready to be the hunted in a fight. Then I think Davis would be at risk. Keep an eye on Jojo Diaz. I thought he won this fight against Tevin Farmer, and it was unclear who was going to win before the fight. I thought he won this fight going away. Right? Those are my thoughts on some recent fights that happened. Let me hear from you. If you have a different take, or you saw the fights and you noticed a few other things, then I hope you leave that information in the comment section of this video. Let me just say this, Clarissa Shields, ooh, with John David Jackson, she's getting better and better. That jab was excellent. I'll just say, at light heavyweight, and I understand, it's a 30-something division, right? Um, let's just say you should expect a lot of turnover, right? John Pascal would be the man if fights were only six rounds long. As champion, he's going to have to fight 12-round fights. I'm just telling you, he's been fading in the second half of fights, right? Badu Jack, all you have to do with Badu Jack is look at the number of close decisions, just read up on what happens in Badu Jack fights. Oh, he almost won. Oh, he came back, but it didn't work out. You know, something happens in the first half of the fight. He gets a bad cut or something, and suddenly his script is all messed up because, of course, his game plan was to give away the first half of the fight and then to come back in the second half of the fight, right? When a fighter can't step on the gas, 
during the first four or five rounds of a 12 round fight, he's closer to retirement than you think. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.